Hey, you found us. Welcome, everybody. This is Scripture Gems. Hello, and welcome to the show. My name is John Fulmer, and this is my brother Jay. How's it going, John? We are two brothers who just can't get enough of the scriptures. Yeah, we love them. This episode, we are going over the Come Follow Me lesson for November 14th through 20th, 2022. This is covering Amos and Obadiah. And now let's bring out the star of the show, the scriptures. Hey, hi, scriptures. You're looking great. And now let's consult the Scripturematic 6000 to find out how long it will take to read this week's reading. 31 minutes, 48 seconds. No problem. What would that be daily? 4 minutes, 32 seconds. Come on, there's no reason to not keep up on our reading this week. Here we've got time codes if you're interested in going chapter by chapter. Otherwise, buckle up. We'll talk about it all together. And for those of you who have inquired about prints of my art that I use in the show, check out 43rdstreet.com. The link is in the video description. Well, let's start with the book of Amos. Let's take our introduction from the seminary manual. It says, Amos was a shepherd who lived in a city called Tekoa, which was about 12 miles south of Jerusalem. We already met someone from Tekoa, if you'll recall, in 2 Samuel chapter 14, verse 2. The wise woman Joab uses to help convince King David to let his son Absalom return to Jerusalem. We talked about it back in episode 25, but back to Amos. The Lord called him to prophesy to the northern kingdom of Israel, a calling he did not expect, but which he obediently fulfilled. Amos preached during the reign of Uzziah in Judah and of Jeroboam II in Israel in the 8th century B.C., Amos may have been a fellow laborer with the prophet Hosea in the kingdom of Israel. Now, from the New Oxford Annotated Bible, it offers this insight. In this period, Israel attained a height of territorial expansion and national prosperity never again reached. At the same time, this prosperity led to gross inequities between urban elite and the poor. Through manipulation of debt and credit, wealthy landowners amassed capital and estates at the expense of small farmers. The smallest debt served as the thin edge of a wedge that lenders could use to separate farmers from their patrimonial lands and to deprive them of personal property. Into this scene stepped Amos, himself a farmer and herder from Tekoa, Amos denounced the society of the northern kingdom Israel in vivid language, bitterly describing the decadent opulence, immorality, and smug piety of the elite who trampled the head of the poor into the dust of the earth, as he says in chapter 2, verse 7. Amos's program, in contrast, called for justice and righteousness, terms that connote social equity and a concern for the disadvantaged. Amos also condemned impure religion, which for him and the other prophets meant worship of deities other than the Lord. Now, an interesting fact, it's not always clear why the shorter prophetic books, those included in the Book of the Twelve in the Jewish Bible, are arranged as they are. We know they're not in chronological order, as we mentioned in our last lesson. Right. Also from the New Oxford Annotated Bible... The traditional arrangement of the Book of the Twelve in the Masoretic text and in the English translations is based not solely on chronology, but often on specific verbal similarities or catchwords that link the end of one book to the beginning of the next. Amos is linked to the preceding Book of Joel by identical phrases and to the following Book of Obadiah by a similar subject. For example, Joel chapter 3 verse 16 reads, The Lord also shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. And Amos chapter 1 verse 2 says, And he said, The Lord will roar from Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. That's kind of interesting. Well, and linking Amos to the following book of Obadiah by similar subject, we're talking about the subject of Edom, which we'll get to at the end of Amos and at the beginning of Obadiah. Let's get started then with Amos chapter 1. In the first verse, Amos mentions an event that was apparently well known among his readers. He begins and ends his book with references to an earthquake. This earthquake had such an impact that it is referenced centuries later in Zechariah chapter 14 verse 5. Perhaps it offered mighty validation to his preaching. 
In the first two chapters, Amos prophesied that destruction would come upon many nations for their wickedness. The chapter uses phrases like, I will send a fire, I will break also the bar, and will go into captivity. Amos taught that the Lord would not turn away the punishment of Judah and Israel as well, since they had despised the law of the Lord, broken his commandments, persecuted the poor, and committed immoral acts in the name of the Lord. See Amos chapter 2 verses 4 through 8. Amos reminded the Israelites that the Lord had delivered them in the past and had raised up prophets and Nazarites to help them. So let's look at some of the condemnation Amos leveled at Israel and see if our hearts are pricked as well. Let's look at chapter 2, starting in verse 6. Thus saith the Lord, For three transgressions of Israel, and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof, because they sold the righteous for silver, and the poor for a pair of shoes. The Institute Manual gives us this insight. The phrase, for three transgressions and for four, does not refer to a specific number of sins, but suggests that the wickedness of the inhabitants of the cities and nations specified in Amos 1 and 2 was very great. A certain level of wickedness would have justified their destruction, but they had sinned above and beyond that level. Going back to the chapter, verse 7, that pant after the dust of the earth on the head of the poor, or as the NRSV translates, they who trample the head of the poor into the dust of the earth. Going on, and turn aside the way of the meek, or as the NRSV says, and push the afflicted out of the way. Back to the verse. And a man and his father will go in unto the same maid to profane my holy name. Now, although it could refer to ritual prostitution, thematically it seems to refer to young unmarried women who, like the needy and the poor, were being exploited. Going on in verse 8. And they lay themselves down upon clothes laid to pledge by every altar, and they drink the wine of the condemned in the house of their God. The NRSV words it this way, They lay themselves down beside every altar on garments taken in pledge, and in the house of their God they drink wine bought with fines they imposed. Now that translation is really helpful because it's easy to see the contrast with the instructions of the law of Moses. Let's look at a couple of those in Exodus twenty-two twenty-five. If thou lend money to any of my people that is poor by thee, thou shalt not be to him as an usurer, neither shalt thou lay upon him usury, meaning to charge them interest, particularly an excessively high interest. Let's take a look too in Deuteronomy 24, 17, also part of the law of Moses. It says, thou shalt not pervert the judgment of the stranger, nor of the fatherless, nor take a widow's raiment to pledge. Right. It's a specific call out. You were not taught this. Yeah, and that's important. Even if we don't understand the specifics of the law, it's just important to know that they're doing the opposite of what they were supposed to be doing. Absolutely. Going back to chapter 2, verse 9. Yet destroyed I the Amorite before them, whose height was like the height of the cedars, and he was strong as the oaks. Yet I destroyed his fruit from above and his roots from beneath. Also I brought you up out of the land of Egypt, and led you forty years through the wilderness to possess the land of the Amorite. And I raised up of your sons for prophets, and of your young men for Nazarites. Is it not even thus, O ye children of Israel, saith the Lord? But ye gave the Nazarites wine to drink, and commanded the prophets, saying, Prophesy not. Now, the Nazarites were consecrated individuals who made covenants with God, including abstaining from wine. Having the Israelites encouraging the Nazarites to drink wine would be similar to church members today encouraging fellow church members to break their covenants. And what about the prophets? They told them to stop warning about the consequences of sin and the coming destruction. Back to the chapter, verse 13. Behold, I am pressed under you. The NRSV renders that, I will press you down in your place, as a cart is pressed that is full of sheaves. 
If you look at the footnote, Israel will be flattened in the road like an animal that is run over by a loaded cart. It's a vivid image. (laughs) I'll say. Verse 14. Therefore the flight shall perish from the swift, and the strong shall not strengthen his force. Neither shall the mighty deliver himself. Neither shall he stand that handleth the bow. And he that is swift of foot shall not deliver himself. Neither shall he that rideth the horse deliver himself. And he that is courageous among the mighty shall flee away naked in that day, saith the Lord. Wow. I hope you've caught the vision for what Amos is setting up here in verse 2. Everything that they think is wrong. Everything that they're doing is backwards. And there are consequences that are going to happen going forward. Yeah, and we need to remember, we've been through First and Second Kings, and we know the history. This is before Israel was invaded by Assyria. As far as they know, they're doing fine. Yeah, they've got important things to learn. Let's keep going with it in Amos chapter 3. To make a very important doctrinal point in verse 7, which Amos is probably most famous for us, Amos 3.7. But to set that up, Amos gives a series of rhetorical questions which permit only a single response. This is to build the case for an inescapable conclusion. Let's take a look at it. Starting in verse 3. Can two walk together, except they be agreed? Will a lion roar in the forest when he hath no prey? Will a young lion cry out of his den if he have taken nothing? Can a bird fall in a snare upon the earth where no jinn, meaning bait or lure, is for him? Shall one take up a snare from the earth and have taken nothing at all? Shall a trumpet be blown in the city and the people not be afraid? Shall there be evil or disaster in a city and the Lord hath not done it? The Joseph Smith translation lets us know it's and the Lord hath not known it. Now we get to verse 7. Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but, or the Joseph Smith translation says, until he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. The lion hath roared, who will not fear? The Lord God hath spoken, who can but prophesy? What a case he makes there. All of this stuff is obvious, and the Lord's use of his prophet is just as obvious. Just as simple as these everyday occurrences happen, God will speak to his prophets, and they shall prophesy. The wicked tell the prophets to prophesy not, but it is the calling of the prophets to teach God's truth. To refuse their message is to reject that truth. I really like this quote that's in the Institute Manual from the April 1975 General Conference. This is from President N. Eldon Tanner. He said, quote, There are many scriptures which assure us that God is as interested in us today as he has been in all his children from the beginning, and thus we believe in continuous revelation from God through his prophets to guide us in these latter days. The prophet Amos said, Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. That's great. So going on from Amos chapter 3, verse 8 through chapter 6, Amos continued to warn the people of destruction, pleading with them to seek the Lord so they would live, like it says in Amos 5, 6, but they would not return to the Lord. It sounds like Amos might be saying to choose life. Right. You think? Yes. From the Institute Manual, we get this quote from Sidney B. Sperry from his book, The Voice of Israel's Prophets. He says, quote, Israel was meticulous in its performance of the outward requirements of its religion, but the inner and less tangible requirements of love, mercy, justice, and humility either were not understood or were disregarded. In an endeavor to bring his people to their senses, the Lord, said Amos, had sent upon them seven natural calamities, cleanness of teeth, or hunger, drought, blasting and mildew, insect pests, pestilence, death by the sword, and burning were brought in succession, but all to no avail. Amos's heart was bleeding over the sinful state of Israel, 
he could do nothing but warn the nation of the final blow which God would send and for which the people must prepare themselves. It was no pleasure for him to pronounce judgment upon his brethren. End quote. So true. Let's take a look at Amos chapter 6. As we take a look at verse 1, look at one of the problems Israel faces. Woe to them that are at ease in Zion, and trust in the mountain of Samaria, which are named chief of the nations, to whom the house of Israel came. Remember that Samaria was the capital of the kingdom of Israel. What does it mean to be at ease in Zion? Did they feel safe in their prosperity? Did they feel confident because they were not then being punished for wickedness? Were they no longer vigilant because they no longer felt they needed the Lord, that they were untouchable? The Institute Manual gives this summary in chapter 6. It says, The Lord enlarged here on the captivity that he foresaw for degenerate Israel. But first, he invited them to visit other places of destruction, Calne in Mesopotamia, Hamath in Syria, Gath in Philistia, and observe what happened to the people there. Were the Israelites any better than they? Certainly not. They had been punished, and so would Israel. Moreover, the wealthy, those who lay on ivory beds and ate sumptuous food, would be the first to suffer. Thus Israel's destruction was made sure by her own choice. Horses cannot run on rocks without slipping, nor can a man plow rocks in order to plant. Verse 12. By the same token, rebellious Israel could not expect to prosper in her state of evil. Verse 13 is an indictment against Israel who rejoiced in casting off the Lord's power and feeling sufficient in and of herself. What Amos had predicted came to pass within 30 years. Mm. That brings us to Amos chapter 7. For chapters 7 through 9, it contains five visions given to Amos. The first three are found in chapter 7. The first one is in the first three verses. It's a swarm of locusts. Verse 1, Thus hath the Lord showed unto me, and behold, he formed grasshoppers in the beginning of the shooting up of the latter growth, and lo, it was the latter growth after the king's mowings. Now, the English Standard Version of the Bible gives us this commentary. Judgment would fall on Israel like a plague of locusts. The latter growth was the wheat crop harvested after the barley. If it was lost, there would be little to eat in the coming year. The king's mowings are the part of the crop paid as a tax to the king. So let's continue in verse 2. And it came to pass that when they had made an end of eating the grass of the land, then I said, O Lord God, forgive, I beseech thee. By whom shall Jacob arise? For he is small. And for verse 3, let's use the Joseph Smith translation. And the Lord said concerning Jacob, Jacob shall repent for this. Therefore, I will not utterly destroy him, saith the Lord. The Institute Manual gives this further insight. The king, who has had the early grass mown, is Jehovah, and the mowing of the grass denotes the judgments which Jehovah has already executed upon Israel. The growing of the second crop is a figurative representation of the prosperity which flourished against those judgments. In actual fact, therefore, it denotes the time when the dawn had risen again for Israel. Let's pick it up in Amos chapter 7, verse 4, with our next vision, devouring fire. Thus hath the Lord God showed unto me, and behold, the Lord God called to contend by fire, and it devoured the great deep, and did eat up a part. Then said I, O Lord God, cease, I beseech thee. By whom shall Jacob arise? For he is small. Again, let's use the Joseph Smith translation for verse 6. And the Lord said concerning Jacob, Jacob shall repent of his wickedness, therefore I will not utterly destroy him, saith the Lord God. The Institute Manual offers this insight. It says, 
The fire that devoured the great deep, presumably the ocean, is symbolic of the partially destructive wars that Israel was later involved in, like the fire which did eat up a part of the great deep. Israel's land was partly despoiled, and many of its people led away. And that brings us to the third vision, starting in verse 7. This is the master builder with the plumb line. Thus he showed me, and behold, the Lord stood upon a wall made by a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said unto me, Amos, what seest thou? And I said, A plumb line. Then said the Lord, Behold, I will set a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will not again pass by them any more. And the high places of Isaac shall be desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. And I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. Now, a plumb line is used to obtain exactness and accuracy in construction work. Here it seems to symbolize that God's strict justice will prevail in judging Israel for her evil ways. All wickedness will be sought out, measured, or judged, and destroyed. Right. So taking a break from the visions, starting in verse 10, we have a very famous episode in Amos of the confronting of the priest of Amaziah in Bethel. Starting in verse 10, Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to Jeroboam, king of Israel, saying, Amos hath conspired against thee in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos saith, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel shall surely be led away captive out of their own land. Also Amaziah said unto Amos, O thou seer, go, flee thee away into the land of Judah, and there eat bread, and prophesy there. But prophesy not again any more at Bethel, for it is the king's chapel, and it is the king's court. Then answered Amos, and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet, neither was I a prophet's son, but I was an herdman and a gatherer of sycamore fruit. And the Lord took me as I followed the flock, and the Lord said unto me, Go, prophesy unto my people Israel. The New Oxford Annotated Bible offers this commentary. It says, Amos described himself as a herdman and as a dresser of sycamore trees. The latter tree is not the same as a North American sycamore, but a type of wild fig tree. These wild figs were gathered by poor people. The small fruit of this tree was inferior to that of the domesticated fig tree. By dressing or gashing the small fruit of this tree, Amos and his cohorts hastened their ripening. This single vivid detail about Amos's background in chapter 7 verse 14 speaks volumes about the prophet's ethics and harsh tone. It explains his solidarity with the poor, who literally scratched out a living in rural Judah and Ephraim, desperate for any harvest, however sparse and bitter. Amos rebuked far more often than he comforted. This arborist, with his knife, understood that pruning was required for revitalization and new growth. Amos lashed out at the elite's prosperity gained at the expense of the poor, upsetting their baskets of summer fruit. I love, too, that for all of the presumptions of Amaziah, Amos reminds him, look, I was a nobody. God called me up to talk to you guys. Now, let's buckle up for Amos's closing message to the priest Amaziah. Continuing on in verse 16. Now, therefore, hear thou the word of the Lord. Thou sayest, prophesy not against Israel, and drop not thy word against the house of Isaac. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, thy wife shall be an harlot in the city, and thy sons and thy daughters shall fall by the sword, and thy land shall be divided by line, and thou shalt die in a polluted land, and Israel shall surely go into captivity forth of his land. This is a brutal string of curses in verse 17. All the honor that Amaziah prized so highly would be taken from him. His wife would belong to other men indiscriminately. He would be deprived of any children. He would lose his property. He would lose his profession because of being defiled by the unclean land to which he would be taken as a captive. 
and he would die as an exile. These terrible punishments would be heaped on this religious leader for rejecting the words of God. And that brings us to Amos chapter 8. In this chapter, Amos has a fourth vision about a basket of summer fruit. The Institute Manual tells us, The harvest of summer fruit symbolized the ripening of Israel. Just as summer fruit must be eaten when picked or it will spoil, Israel was ripe for picking and spoiling by enemies. Let's take a look at chapter 8, verse 9. And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord God, that I will cause the sun to go down at noon, and I will darken the earth in the clear day. The Institute Manual gives us this insight. A man's sun can be said to set at noon if he is taken by death during the prime of his life. A nation's sun figuratively sets at noon when the country is destroyed in the midst of its prosperity. But Amos's dual prophecy is also a reminder that before the second coming of the Lord, the sun will be darkened and refuse to give her light. Indeed, it will be a sign for the wicked of the latter days that their sun is about to set at noon. Dark. Let's continue on in verse 11. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water but of hearing the words of the Lord. And they shall wander from sea to sea and from the north even to the east. They shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord and shall not find it. The seminary manual offers this insight. It says the prophecy recorded in Amos chapter 8 verses 11 and 12 has been fulfilled during several different periods in history. One important fulfillment of this prophecy is the great apostasy, when the world was left without divine revelation through living prophets. Also from the New Oxford Annotated Bible, it offers this insight. Although the reigns of Jeroboam II and Uzziah were relatively peaceful and prosperous in Israel and Judah, the region experienced calamitous upheaval shortly thereafter when Tiglath-Pileser III assumed the throne in Assyria. He began the period of Assyria's greatest expansion in the West, including conquering the smaller kingdoms of Syria-Palestine. His successors, Shalmaneser V and Sargon II, invaded the northern kingdom and conquered Samaria in 722. Within a few decades of Amos' prophetic activity, the northern kingdom saw devastation and destruction, which made his foreboding words all the more sobering. And for an even more modern application, the Institute Manual includes this quote from October 1975 General Conference. Elder Joseph B. Worthlin, who at the time was the executive area administrator for one of the European areas, spoke of the effect this famine had had upon Europe. Quote, We have observed a restless spirit of searching today among the people of Europe. Why? Why? Because there is a gnawing hunger in the human heart that, if not fed by the truths of the gospel, leaves life empty and devoid of peace. The hodgepodge of economic isms advocated by so-called wise men of the world has solved few, if any, problems and has brought no real joy. Such empty nostrums have left mankind to seek worldly goods and symbols of material power blinding humanity to the truth that only the righteous life firmly established in the daily living of God's commandments brings true happiness. Anything less leaves the heart unfed with a yearning inner hunger, a hunger which it is our mission to identify and define and of which we should make the people aware. I have seen in Europe the fulfillment of the words of Amos, that there would be a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, but of hearing the words of the Lord, end quote. So true. Let's move on to Amos chapter 9. The first six verses tell of the fifth vision of Amos. The Institute Manual summarizes it this way. From his dwelling place, the Lord will smite the wicked. There is none to escape, hide where they may. Only the second coming of the Lord fulfills such a description. For when the Lord comes in his glory, the rewards of justice will be met. 
No mountain is high enough, no sea so deep, that the unrepented sinner can hide from the judgments of a just God. Although Amos saw apostasy and destruction, he also saw the restoration in the latter days, when the Israelites would be gathered again and restored to their promised land. Let's pick it up in chapter 9, verse 11. In that day will I raise up the tabernacle of David that is fallen, and close up the breaches thereof, and I will raise up his ruins, and I will build it as in the days of old, that they may possess the remnant of Edom, and of all the heathen which are called by my name, saith the Lord that doeth this. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that the plowman shall overtake the reaper, and the treader of grapes him that soweth the seed, and the mountains shall drop sweet wine, and all the hills shall melt, and I will bring again the captivity of my people of Israel, and they shall build the waste cities, and inhabit them, and they shall plant vineyards, and drink the wine thereof. They shall also make gardens, and eat the fruit of them, and I will plant them upon their land, and they shall no more be pulled up out of their land which I have given them, saith the Lord thy God. What a hopeful message and a great way to wrap up the book of Amos. Let's take a look then at the book of Obadiah. For an introduction, let's turn to the seminary manual, which says Obadiah chapter 1 verse 1 states that this book records a vision the Lord gave to a prophet named Obadiah. Though a number of individuals named Obadiah are mentioned in 1 Kings, 1 and 2 Chronicles, Ezra, and Nehemiah, these are references to other persons. Apart from the fact that Obadiah was a prophet in the southern kingdom of Judah, we do not know anything about his background or ministry. Fittingly, the name Obadiah means servant of the Lord. Obadiah's prophecy dates to soon after one of the captures of Jerusalem, probably the conquest by the Babylonians in approximately 586 BC. So this means that Obadiah was likely a contemporary of Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel, and maybe even Lehi. Interesting. Obadiah is the shortest book in the Hebrew Bible, containing only 21 verses by modern organizers. The first portion refers to the people of Edom. The land of Edom, also known as Idumea, was southeast of the kingdom of Judah and was inhabited by the descendants of Esau, the son of Isaac and twin brother of Jacob. Despite their close kinship, mutual hatred had existed for generations between the Edomites and the Israelites. Now, for most of the book, Obadiah prophesied that the Edomites would be conquered because they had refused to help defend the Jews against Babylon and had even rejoiced that Jerusalem was destroyed. In verses 3 through 9, it seems clear that the Edomites had perhaps a false sense of security. To help us understand why, let's take a look at a picture of Petra in modern-day Jordan. You might recognize this as the Canyon of the Crescent Moon from the documentary Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Ha <laughs> ha, documentary. <laughs> the Institute Manual gives us this commentary. The world-famous ruins of Petra in modern Jordan are remarkable. A whole city was carved out of rock cliffs. It could be entered only through a narrow gorge. From the high cliffs, the Edomites could protect themselves from invading enemies with great success. Petra, or Mount Seir, was in the land of Edom, and many scholars think it was the capital of Idumea. Though many of the ruins now visible at Petra date from a later period, they still give dramatic impact to Obadiah's words. Right. The seminary manual offers that in Obadiah's record, the wickedness and destruction of Edom could symbolize the latter-day wickedness and destruction of the world. Here it references Doctrine and Covenants 1, verse 36. Let's pick it up in Obadiah, verse 17. But upon Mount Zion shall be deliverance, and there shall be holiness, and the house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. The seminary manual offers this insight. It says, Obadiah's prophecy concerning Mount Zion has multiple meanings. The word deliverance in Obadiah verse 17 implies escape from danger and destruction. One fulfillment of this prophecy occurred when a remnant of Israel returned from captivity, rebuilt Jerusalem and the temple, 
and covenanted once more to serve and obey God. Anciently, the restoration of Israel served as a type and shadow of the great Latter-day gathering of Israel and the deliverance that would come to God's children through the restoration of the gospel, which included the ordinances and covenants of the temple. Geographically, Mount Zion refers to the hill or mount upon which King Solomon built the temple in Jerusalem. However, the term can also refer more generally to the city of Jerusalem or to the entire land of Israel. Modern revelation also applies the term to the New Jerusalem, which will be built in America in the latter days, and also to the celestial kingdom of God. So going on in verse 18, And the house of Jacob shall be a fire, and the house of Joseph a flame, and the house of Esau for stubble. And they shall kindle in them and devour them, and there shall not be any remaining of the house of Esau, for the Lord hath spoken it. And they of the south shall possess the mount of Esau, and they of the plain the Philistines. And they shall possess the fields of Ephraim, and the fields of Samaria, and Benjamin shall possess Gilead. And the captivity of this host of the children of Israel shall possess that of the Canaanites, even unto Zarephath. And the captivity of Jerusalem, which is in Sepharad, shall possess the cities of the south. And saviors shall come up on Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau, and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. The seminary manual gives us this insight. The word savior can refer to one who saves, rescues, or delivers. Jesus Christ is the savior because he saves and delivers us from sin and death, which we cannot do for ourselves. What a great image. I don't know if these lands sound familiar to you as we've talked about them this year, but essentially what Obadiah is saying is that all of those people in this land who have oppressed you and have exercised power over you, they will fall. And because of your righteousness and faith in the Lord, what they have will become yours. Now, Latter-day prophets have used this last verse, verse 21, to teach about our day. Joseph Smith, this is from Teachings of Presidents of the Church, Joseph Smith, said this, But how are they to become saviors on Mount Zion? By building their temples, erecting their baptismal fonts, and going forth and receiving all the ordinances, baptisms, confirmations, washings, anointings, ordinations, and sealing powers upon their heads in behalf of all their progenitors who are dead, and redeem them that they may come forth in the first resurrection and be exalted to thrones of glory with them. And more recently, the Come Follow Me manual includes a quote from October 2004 General Conference. President Gordon B. Hinckley gave one possible interpretation of the phrase, Saviors on Mount Zion, connecting the phrase to temple and family history work. Quote, In the temple, we literally become saviors on Mount Zion. What does this mean? Just as our Redeemer gave his life as a vicarious sacrifice for all men, and in so doing became our Savior, even so we, in a small measure, when we engage in proxy work in the temple, become as saviors to those on the other side who have no means of advancing unless something is done in their behalf by those on earth, end quote. This has been such an interesting exploration of looking at prophets called to help nations repent who had covenanted with God and yet were falling away. And then we in our study have gotten to see the consequences of not turning to the Lord, the consequences of not repenting and having his name written in our hearts. It's not about what we're doing. That's only a part of it. But where is our heart in all of this? And one of the things that really impresses me is that one, we should really be paying attention to this as people that have made covenants with God, but also how hopeful all of this is. I hope that it's been helpful to get to know these two prophets, Amos and Obadiah, that we don't really talk about a whole lot. I hope you found some gems that will continue to help you in your daily life and that you can share with your families and friends. Keep reading your scriptures, and we'll look forward to talking to you more about them in our next lesson. We'll see you then. This podcast is not officially affiliated with The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but we're really big fans. 